Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I am, as always, Nicholas Tyson, your teacher, your mentor, hopefully not your sensei. I still hate that word. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to. So originally I was going to do Buddhism, sorry, Zen Buddhism last week、um, in the context of the, the Taiheiki, but I had a sort of revelation <laughs> in the nick of time and realized that it's actually far more appropriate to discuss in relationship to today's topic. So, first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle Zen Buddhism, a little bit about its history, and also some of, sort of the, the finer details that we need to know. And then in the next video, I'll talk more explicitly about、um, no theater、um, historically, but also specifically in the context of you know, Zayami and Ka- his father, Kanami. And you know, we'll get into all of the, the weird things there. <laughs> but for today and for this video, switch to that. Okay. So, we're going to be talking about our good friend, Mr. Zen, and his Buddhism. No, there was no Mr. Zen. So, okay, so the word Zen here literally just means meditation.、Um, and meditation, especially like seated meditation, although not exclusively seated meditation, is really、um, key to this particular school or sort of like stream of Buddhism, precisely because. Meditation was seen as a way to sort of practice enlightenment, and that this is sort of a thing that will keep coming up. This idea that you don't just sort of like reach enlightenment, enlightenment is not something that you experience, but you can actually like do enlightenment, you can practice it. And so, at least in the Japanese context, the first person that we need to talk about, although it's not the one I'm actually, I mean, in terms of like、uh, How it will be relevant later for talking about the, the no theater is not as relevant. <laughs> But I first want to talk about this guy, Eisai. And so here are his dates. So you see that he was born near the end of the, the Heian period, and then he died well into the, the Kamakura period. So, like Honen, the, you know, the, the, the pure land dude, he was someone who experienced. The, the turmoil and the transition from you know, the culture of the Heian period to the Kamakura period. And in fact, he was actually originally or, ordained as a, as a Tendai monk on Mount Hiei. So he was originally an esoteric Buddhist.、Um, I never really, oh, we'll get into this. He never really disavowed it, <clears throat> but he was sort of dissatisfied. With the state of Buddhism at the time. So, like many of his predecessors, he decided to go to grad school. <laughs>、um, Asai is, I will get to that in a second. Asai is probably most well known as the founder of the, one of the two major sects, the Rinzai sect of Zen.、Um, so, he traveled to China in 1168 to actually study at the, the mountain that gives Tendai its name,、uh, Mount Tiantai.、Um, Where he, which is actually where he first learned of what in Chinese is called Chen,、um, in, and then obviously in Japanese it's called Zen. It's the same word, it's the same character.、Um, and he was there for, for quite a while, for near, in fact, more than 20 years now, I think. Yeah, more than 20 years, like 23 years.、Um, he eventually returned to, so it's interesting that he sort of he left for China. Just as things were about to get go pear shaped, essentially, politically. And then he returned after it had been, quote unquote, resolved <laughs> in 1191. And in 1191, he founded the very first、um, Japanese Zen temple, interestingly, in Kyushu. Now, for those of you who have your sort of like mental Japanese map, you know, Honshu is the banana. And Kyushu is the sort of the, the Mekon or the, the Mandarin orange that's stuck on at the end of the banana to, to like the south and the west. So, th- the reason why this is important is that it's very far away from either of the then contemporary power centers. So, in 1191, you have this kind of like competing political dynamic between Kyoto in the west and Kamakura in the east. Um, Kyushu is near neither of them. <laughs> it's, not, it's not anywhere close to either of them. So, in many ways, Zen began its life in Japan as kind of a, like an also ran, a, b- a bit of an outsider. But that sort of outsider status is also kind of what helped it persevere for an extremely long time. Zen never really became, in fact, to this day, it's not a prominent. It's not like the most prominent form of Buddhism in Japan. In fact, that it still is pure land.、Um, 
Although, interestingly enough, outside of Japan, it is what most people understand to be Japanese Buddhism. It's actually Zen Buddhism, and specifically Japanese Zen Buddhism. Um, so after his return to Japan, one of the sort of interesting things about Asai is that he sort of he went the the other direction from from Honen. Instead of like actively antagonizing the existing um, religious power structure and the religious hierarchy, he actually kind of like schmoozed himself politically. And the way he achieved this is basically by ingratiating himself to the the Minamoto clan, who were who still hadn't quite been sort of pushed to one side by the Hojo. This is at a time when the Minamoto were still very firmly in power. And he was definitely a favorite of Yoritomo, so that's Minamoto no Yoritomo's widow, Masako, um, and his son Yorie, who became the the second Kamakura Shogun. Um, and what's interesting about this, then, as a result of sort of like ingratiating himself with the, sort of the, the existing political power structure, is that um, Asai never actually renounced his Tendai ordination. In other words, he, he kind of was always both Zen and Tendai. And in fact, it never really thought of them as mutually exclusive. So this is very, very different from, you know, the story of, you know, how Pure Land rose to prominence. Pure Land, almost by definition, because it sort of, at least as, as Honen presented it, was sort of like mutually exclusive. It's, you know, he, he made the argument that like, you know, <laughs> esoteric Buddhism is fine in and of itself. But he kept saying like, you know, in this age, in our degenerate age, you know, we, we can't we can't do that anymore. We have to do this new kind of Buddhism. Whereas from Asai's perspective, it's like you can do this as well. So this is sort of an additive property. Zen is a thing that you can do in addition. Now, that will not be true with the other um, sort of like, I guess you could say, Zen progenitor that we'll be talking about, but definitely is true for Asai. And so that brings me to a really, really important point about the history of Zen Buddhism in Japan, is that, so th there were there were people before Asai, but Asai is credited with being sort of like, I mean, he was the first to found like an actual school of Zen Buddhism in Japan, first to found a Zen temple. So he's credited with it, but there had been Zen rumblings, I guess you could say, in Japan as far back as the late Heian period. But, and this was true of Pure Land as well, you know, Pure Land had had kind of rumblings in the late Heian period, um, but it never actually supplanted any of the streams of Buddhism that preceded it, and never even really sought to. The two major strategies that sort of, that the, that the two big founders, Asai and Dogen, used in Asai's case it was basically um, appeasement it's just like well I need to figure out a way to work this into the existing system and Dogen's solution is just like well screw you guys <laughs> I'm taking my ball and going home and I'll just like go off into the middle of nowhere and do my own thing and you guys don't have to hear from me ever again so he kind of like self-exiled whereas um, because Pure Land was was and remains a sort of more populist Buddhism, it kind of had to remain amongst the people, whereas Zen, much like um, esoteric Buddhism, was kind of more hoity-toity. And so, in many ways, um, Zen and esotericism are not, in fact, incompatible at all. And that's not just, you know, due to, like, the political realities of how it worked historically, but also in sort of, like, the practices themselves are not incompatible, um, despite actually being very different approaches. So central to both esoteric Buddhism and to Zen Buddhism is this concept of the Buddha nature. Now, if you guys don't recall <clears throat> from back when I first talked about esoteric Buddhism, uh, the Buddha nature is this idea that like everyone at any point in their life is capable of nirvana, of, of achieving nirvana, of escape from the, the cycle of death and rebirth. And that's always true. And so, and that, and what we call that is the Buddha nature. It's that, like, so you have a potential Buddha inside you. You have a potential for like, you know, pure enlightenment inside you at all times. And so the question then is like, well, how do you get to there? From the esoteric perspective, the way you get to there is by going to grad school. <laughs> from, from the Zen perspective, and as we'll get into this, I'll, I'll talk about sort of how Zen actually believes you, you get to that sort of essential Buddha condition that's always potentially inside you. Um, the other thing that they have in common is that 
is the focus on self-perfection. Now, so what this means is that in both the case of Zen and esoteric Buddhism, the idea is that sort of you yourself are always like the means to achieve nirvana. Like it is always in you. It's about, it's about, per, it's about conditioning yourself, disciplining yourself, doing things for and to yourself in order to achieve this state. Whereas Pure Land posits that that state can only be achieved basically from without, that you have to be saved. And so in both of these cases, in both the case of Zen Buddhism and esoteric Buddhism, the, the sort of the salvation is not necessary. You can always save yourself. And the way in which they fundamentally differ, that is esoteric Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, is sort of the means by which you do that. So in the case of esotericism, <clears throat> as I said, the means is going to grad school. Um, another important sort of commonality, although this isn't a commonality in terms of like, you know, the actual practice, but in sort of the historical condition, is that they were both associated with an upper class of some kind. In the case of esoteric Buddhism, it was associated primarily with the nobility, as we saw in the Heian period, whereas Zen Buddhism will be very much associated with the, the warrior classes. The warrior class was really, really, really into to Zen because of this whole idea of sort of like self-conditioning and self-discipline and so forth. So what is the means? Okay, so the primary, one of the primary ones is this thing known as Zazen, which literally just means, so you, you can, for those of you who can read Chinese or Japanese, you can see like the seat sitting down <laughs> and then you got meditation. So this is the Zen right here. So you got seated meditation. Now, it's more than just sitting down and meditating. <laughs> but it, I mean, that's what it's called. It's called seated meditation, but there is more to it than that. Although there actually are some strains of Zen Buddhism that do, in fact, um, advocate for just for so-called mere sitting. But even mere sitting is not mere sitting. Um, what, what it's actually meant to do, the, the whole point of sort of focusing on like, you know, sitting and breathing and sort of like, you know, practices of mindfulness is that you're supposed, it's supposed to be a means to achieve like a state. Um, I have it, I call it a, a certain quietude and that's not the greatest explanation, but it's, it's a state in which you suspend judgment. So you suspend like, you know, sort of like the rational, like like the machinery of your brain constantly churning, and you let thoughts pass through your mind without actually engaging them, without getting wrapped up in them. So the idea is not sort of that you sort of clear your mind. That's actually a misconception about Zen Buddhism. Meditation is not about sort of like removing everything from your mind. It's more about making the things that sort of are constantly whirling about in your head irrelevant. And so in essence, it's an attempt to discipline your mind. So like the discipline of the body, you know, like maintaining certain positions, you know, like controlling your breathing. So like the discipline of the body is then correlated with disciplining the mind. And then related to that, and this is probably the most important concept in like all streams of Zen Buddhism, is this notion of, well, these are usually paired together. Sometimes you'll, you'll probably, at least in, in English language discourse, you'll more commonly see the word um, satori. Um, and then here's the here's the Japanese for that. Interestingly enough, for those of you who are familiar with the um, the the Chinese story, the journey into the West, you'll probably recognize that character right there. <clears throat> That's not by accident. <laughs> uh, all right, so Kensho and Satori uh, are not actually the same thing, though they're usually lumped together. Kensho literally means to sort of see. It, so we have the character for C here. And I don't know if this is as true in Chinese as it is in Japanese, but in Japanese, this is usually used for like gender compounds. So like, so the, the, the shou here, which is usually read say when it's used in gender compounds. But the basic meaning of this character is like essence or nature, sort of something like some fundamental characteristic. And so Kensho can literally be read as sort of like seeing one's own essence. And Satori is just the articular form of a verb, Satoru, which means to understand or to perceive. So it could be perceiving or understanding. And the reason why this is sort of fundamental is because 
in Zen Buddhism, the whole point is that you're supposed to try and recognize, to understand, to observe, whatever verb you want to use, your Buddha nature. Now, the way that actually works is that it's not about a kind of rational, like, you're not supposed to, like, work it out mechanically or in a kind of philosophical way by, like, constructing a proof in your head and then understanding who you are as a human being. In fact, you're actually supposed to do the exact opposite. You're supposed to clear all that stuff away so that the only, so that's the whole point of like letting the, those, those conscious thoughts just pass through without engaging them. Because the reason why you don't engage them is because they are actually covering over your Buddha nature, your true essence. And so by not engaging with them, that is the way in which you perceive your true self, your true nature. And as I note down here, the only way to do that is to sort of, if not remove, because, because you know, Buddhists would argue that you can't actually, like, stop your thinking. That, that too, is sort of, that, that, that's a bad practice as well. You, can't, you don't just stop thinking. But it's more like to suspend your conscious thoughts. To, like, have them there, but also have them not impact you. And so, those two things. So, so the idea of sort of, like, meditation as like a physical practice that allows you like a physical conditioning that sort of then helps you condition your mind. And then this idea of sort of like seeing one's essence or like understanding one's Buddha nature as not necessarily like arriving there logically or through like a systematic argument or proof of some kind, but actually in a sort of like a clearing away or at least sort of a suspension of your conscious rational mind. So with that, we'll transition a little bit to our second character, our second NPC. Um, this guy, Dolgen, who I'll actually focus on a little bit more, at least in terms of his actual writing. Now, like Asai, he was dissatisfied with Tendai, but unlike Asai, he actually was more antagonistic towards it. Um, and unlike Asai, instead of like trying to find a way to sort of appease the existing power structure, he just decided to, you know, say like, screw you guys. I'm going like, I'm going to go off and do my own thing. He was unlike Honen in that he wasn't like confrontational. Like he didn't sort of like openly <laughs> try, try to argue that, you know, esoteric Buddhism is full of crap, but he was just like, I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, there are a lot of aspects of Dogen's writing. He wrote a ton, both in Japanese and in Chinese, and I can't possibly like deal with all of it. This is just an introduction. The one really important concept that I want to focus on in, in Dogen's teachings is the way in which he addresses temporality. The reason why is because it'll be relevant for what I have to say about Atsumori. Um, so central, one of the central concepts in Dogen's teachings is this idea of oneness, or more specifically, uh, the, the oneness of practice enlightenment. So if you recall, I said um, earlier in this video that one of the things that distinguishes Zen is this idea that you sort of do enlightenment. In other words, instead of sort of nirvana being a state that you reach through some ritual or practice, um, Enlightenment is the practice itself. There is a kind of unity, a oneness, a sort of a merging of the thing that you do with the state in which you want to be or, just, or the thing you want to become, that the two are not actually distinct. And recognizing this non-distinction is key to Zen Buddhism as a philosophy. And so within Dogen's teachings, there is this uh, it, it's weird. It's kind of a made-up term, and it's kind of not a made-up term. It's actually a willful misreading of this. So, like, if you were reading through, say, classical Japanese, and you saw those two characters written in a text, you would probably read them as arutoki, which is an extremely common phrase in Japanese, in fact, even to this day. It literally means, like, one time, and then one time. So, it's, it's an ordinary phrase that he willfully misreads. In other words, he reads it as if it were a Chinese word. E even though it's a, it's a representation of a Japanese phrase, he reads it as if it were a Chinese word, meaning sort of being and time. So time and being as one um, unified concept. 
and it is a it is a really it's a key metaphysical concept in Dogen's writing that if you don't understand it, like you really can't <laughs> grasp what he's getting at at all. It's usually translated as being time or time being. Sometimes I see it as um, in the the reading I had you guys do today. It's actually translated as the existential moment, which I personally don't find to be the greatest <laughs> translation, but you know it is what it is. So, like I said, this key metaphysical concept. So, what is being time? Well, in many ways, it's it's simply a recognition of the fact that existence and time are not two distinct things. In other words, in sort of lay terms, it's convenient to think of ourselves as sort of like existing in time. Like time is a sort of like a container, and then our existence is inside of it. What Dogen would say is like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way at all. Like time and existence are synonymous. Like time come itself, time itself comes into being as a result of existence, and existence is sort of the manifestation of time. There's this kind of like interplay between things that we think of as distinct, but in fact aren't. It's more like we're sort of like looking at the same thing from different perspectives. So let's take a look at a, um, a bit of the, the this text um, on Uji. Let's see, what is it, 140? Oh yeah, right here at the bottom. So this paragraph, right y'all. Okay, so he says, the eye unfolds and becomes the world in its entirety. And one should see that all beings, all things, constitute moments in this entirety of the world. Just as different things do not interfere with each other, different moments do not interfere with each other either. This is why the mind... Okay, and this is probably the key phrase here. This is why the mind arises in the same moment, the moment arises in the same mind. So, think of it this way. Inside your head you're thinking of, say, the concept of time, while at the same time, time itself as a concept can contain the notion of your conscious mind. So that's the interplay, that, or for, rather the, the non-distinction, is, is the fact that like one imagines the other, but the other contain the thing that imagined it, that can contain the thing that, et cetera. And you know, it's, it's this feedback loop, and you see as a result of this feedback loop, that ultimately you're, you're talking about the same phenomenon just in different terms. And so, strangely enough, it's a lot, it's similar to um, the way Plato in sort of like Greek philosophy talks about sort of the concept of ideas or, or forms. And so, Plato uses this analogy to talk, so Plato argues that sort of like, for example, you know, I have a mug here and that for, you know, for every... <laughs> oh geez okay that's i'm gonna have to fix my mic after this <laughs> that was really bad uh so the idea is that for like for every existing mug there's sort of an ideal mug that sort of lies underlies or is is the primary form of all mugs and so his point is that like when we see an individual mug um we are only seeing one aspect and so in the same way that sort of like you know for from your perspective like you the camera can only see this side I sitting here can only see this side. We're looking at the same object, but we're seeing it in two fundamentally different ways. And so Dogen is trying to make a similar point here, is that sort of being and time and existence and time, the mind and the world are the same phenomenon, but when we call it mind or when we call it world, we're simply looking at that phenomenon, that moment as he calls it, from different perspectives. So to go back to our outline real quick. <clears throat> and so it's really important for understanding Dogen's teaching that like the way in which, actually I'll just, I'll just move on. So like the, sort of to explain this in, in like more timey terms rather than sort of in these sort of like weird existential terms. If you look at page 150 when he talks more explicitly about the existential moment. So this paragraph right here I think is really important. The existential moment has the quality of shifting. It shifts from what we call today into tomorrow. It shifts in turn from today into yesterday and from yesterday into today. It shifts from today into today. It shifts from tomorrow into tomorrow. 
This is because shifting is the quality of the momentary. The moments of the past and the present do not pile up on each other. In other words, what he's saying is like, there, there's not a quantity of time. In other words, it's not that like there was a yesterday, a today, and a tomorrow, and then those three days sort of add up to equate to time, but rather like yesterday, today, tomorrow are all facets of time. They're all perspectives. And so in that same way that sort of like, you know, if you imagine like this mug that I have here as time, as sort of the singular moment of time, then, you know, essentially what he's saying is that like today, so yesterday is like looking at it this way. Today is like looking at it this way. Tomorrow is like looking at it this way and the next day and the next day and the next so and the next day and the next day and the next. So you're seeing different facets. It looks different each time, but ultimately it's the same thing. And so that's that's what he means by sort of this idea of shifting, because literally in order for if you're seeing it from this perspective, you know, like if you're seeing it from the today perspective, if you want to see it from the tomorrow perspective, what does the moment, the thing have to do? It has to shift. Because your perspective and my perspective, similarly, are fixed. So in order for us to see it from a different perspective, then the thing we're observing, it has to shift. So that's what he means by the existential moment has the quality of shifting. In other words, our being is a, to- is a totality, like the way we are today, the way we are tomorrow, the way we'll be in 40 years, like all that together is, is myself, is ourselves. But because we experience it in temporal terms, that's simply us, the, the essence of ourselves shifting. And so to see past the difference, you have to understand that the differences themselves aren't actually differences. They're just shifts. They're just turns, as it were. <clears throat> and so ultimately then from, from Dogen's perspective is that the clearing away that we need to do is essentially of that. The, the goal of this particular form of Zen, Zen practice is to sort of see the unity that ultimately underlies all of our false perceptions. So our false, per- and, but our false perception is not the things we see. This is really, this is really an important point. The false perception is not seeing this, seeing this, seeing this, seeing this, etc. Those aren't the false perceptions. The false perception is the mind assuming or believing that those are all different. So the, the individual things that we know are not the problem. And that's why you don't want to clear them from your mind. The point is to actually recognize the non-distinction between them, between self and other, between like myself and the world, between you know existence and time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The assumption of difference is actually the false perception, not sort of the, like the individual things that we know, the individual thoughts that we have. So I didn't mean to get too <laughs> airy fairy there, but um, so that's it for this video, or at least a, as much as I want to say about Zen Buddhism, there's a lot more that could be said, but this is not a class about Japanese religion, as I've said in the past. So we're going to leave it there for now. Um, and I guess I will see you all in the next video.